Nelson, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to join us here on the Zero Excuses podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. I know we've had a little hiccup uh, initially here getting this uh, lined up, but I'm fine. Or I'm glad we're finally able to uh, connect in that. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Nelson, you are a four-time uh, U.S. memory champion, a avid mountain climber. Uh, you've got a lot going on. Uh, you know, give yourself a little bit more detailed introduction. I'll let the audience know exactly uh, what you're up to these days. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what I'm known for these days is uh, the fact that my memory is one of the best in the country, potentially even the world. But I, I didn't start out that way. That's something that. I've trained over the last 10 years. Believe it or not, at one point, I actually had a pretty abysmal memory or just slightly below average. And so I started along this journey of memory and uh, competitive memorizing because my I saw my grandmother suffer from Alzheimer's and that kind of inspired me to take matters into my own hands and see if there was anything I could do for my brain early now when I was young so that when I got older, that potentially wouldn't happen to me. Right on. So uh, was this uh, something something that happened during your teen years or, or after you, uh, you know, kind of reached adulthood? Well, I was kind of at the tail end of college and then into grad school when she was deteriorating worse and worse year by year. And then she passed away kind of in the middle of when I, I, um, I was in grad school. So when it started, you know, I was still a student, a grad student studying, finishing my master's and you know, the memory shtick kind of was my side hobby. Mm -hmm. um, I never expected it to become me winning championships or me doing this full time now. Uh, it was just something I wanted to do because, you know, it was on my mind. Yeah. So I guess what were kind of your first, first initial steps? I'm just kind of teeing this up a little bit for someone who might be uh, listening to this, who might have like a, uh, I guess, a, a mindset that, you know, they've got a terrible memory. How, what were yeah. some of those first initial uh, steps that you started taking? Yeah. I mean, it started with, you know, I, I'm sure like a bunch of li your listeners and a bunch of people that I meet all the time, uh, you know, they think that they have a a memory a certain way, whether it's good or bad or in the middle, and then that it's fixed, right? That's, you can't do anything about it. And I was of that camp as well. I didn't really think I had a good memory. And I thought that was just kind of like Nelson's deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just had to deal with it um, and accept it. So when I heard about these competitions, you know, I, I looked up one of the former U uh, world champions, and he had an audio book that I downloaded. Um, well, I guess at the time I had the CD. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, and then I, uh, you know, I, I was, I had just moved to Chicago and I was just walking around the city a lot, listening to it and trying some of the exercises, a little skeptical, you know, that, Hey, I couldn't be, I, I don't think I'm able to memorize a thousand digit number or, um, a room full of people's names and decks of cards and stuff. But, you know, the exercises that he walked me through were very convincing that there was a little more to my memory than I actually previously thought. And that with these techniques, um, I could actually potentially do a lot more, especially if I practiced uh, kind of regularly. Okay. So I, I guess from a physio physiological standpoint, what does, um, what happens when you start working on your memory skills? What, you know, can you break that down a little bit? I, I don't know if you're, 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 you know, you can speak to that, but. Yeah, a little bit, I think. Um, you know, okay, let's, let's take memory techniques out of the picture for a second. And let's just say that you have an average memory and you want to try and make it better and you don't know any techniques. So what do you do? You probably would say, okay, I'm going to start memorizing something daily. Maybe you, maybe you'll choose some, something kind of similar every day. So you can kind of measure the progress. Um, you know, maybe it is numbers, right? You start trying to see if you can memorize a 20 digit number as fast as possible. Uh, and then the next day, maybe you try to do a bit faster or you try to do a little more, right? Just by doing that, I think you'll f naturally figure out your own strategies to actually get better at it. Um, but then when you apply, um, you know, memory techniques, that just catapults the increase so much faster. But what my point is, is that when you try to go in this um, physiologically, you know, I don't know, in your mind, you're, you're making different kinds of connections that you probably wouldn't have thought without trying. Mm -hmm. um, there's this famous study that was done um, a number of maybe in the 90s um, at Florida State. And uh, they tested two people with their digit span, um, for, with their memory for digit span. So they would say numbers out loud. 
uh, one per second, I believe. And, you know, at the beginning, the two subjects couldn't hold more than 10 things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what happened is actually one of them was a runner, uh, an athlete. And what happened is as he got better practicing at it, he would incorporate some things that made sense to him, like times that uh, he'd hear numbers and they'd remind him of times it took to run a mile or uh, a distance, you know? And he'd come up with those pictures just kind of naturally. And I think eventually he got to um, 80 digits in a row, mm. uh, which is phenomenal with no knowledge of these techniques. So I think naturally, if you try, uh, your brain will figure out strategies to uh, be able to memorize better. Yeah, it sounds like you just have to start constructing an algorithm almost in your own brain like to exactly. make these connections and, yeah. and and so why why do you think the common i guess the common uh, mindset is that our memories are are fixed i mean that's probably one of the biggest excuses that uh you know you yeah. hear today i mean <laughs> we're we're on the zero excuses podcast and that's <laughs> like the number one thing exactly oh, not, like that's that's so common but i guess what uh what i'm trying to ask here is is what uh, what was the mental shift that you finally uh, made? What was was there an aha moment, or did this happen gradually over time? No, it was pretty like there was one kind of moment, um, and it was in this audio book. The guy goes through an example of how to memorize ten things using this ancient Greek technique, mm -hmm. and it sounded kind of fluffy and over the top. And I was like, this sounds like way too much work. I don't know if it's going to work for me. I just followed along with what he was saying. And by the end of it, I was like, oh, wow. Uh, I, I just memorized that forwards and backwards. And it was almost like I didn't even try. <laughs> that was really the moment where I was thinking, okay, if that was so easy um, and you know, I can, I can apply that to all the other things that I struggle with, then maybe I can actually do this and get better at it if I spent some time. So you, you started down this path to like, from more of a practical standpoint than, than more of a competitive standpoint. Am I understanding that right? Yeah. I mean, at first it was more personal. Um, the more I kind of got into this audiobook and practicing and getting faster, I was like, you know what? I wonder how I stack up against others um, in the U S and I realized I was actually not too shabby at that point. Um, so I, I threw myself in the ring and, and, and wanted to give myself a, a, a chance. I didn't do so well the very first year, but it, you know, it got me inspired even further to come back the next year and, and win it. Awesome. So, um, so you've been at this for, for about 10 years. What I, I know I mentioned that, uh, you're four time U S champion. What other accolades, uh, have you, what other accomplishments do you have? Yeah. So there's this title called the grandmaster of memory. Um, what you have to do in the world championships, which is held once a year, is you have to memorize a thousand digit number, at least in an hour, um, 10 packs of cards in an hour, at least, and then uh, a single deck of cards in under two minutes. Those three, if you do those, um, you collect the title. Um, and there's not many grandmasters uh, around the world. I believe there's maybe one other American, uh, a, an older competitor, but um, I was the second to get that one. Yeah. And then I have a, a, a few U.S. records for the different disciplines. Names and Faces is one of my um, best ones. You know, I had a record, 201 names in 15 minutes. Uh, and then last year I broke it, 217, but somebody else broke that. So uh, now I'm trying to train a little harder to get that back. Um, yeah. I've had this the memorizing a deck of cards record and numbers record, but they get taken away because people are always pushing the limits, you know? Oh yeah. So I guess uh, from a practical standpoint, what has uh, working on your memory done for you, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what advantages have you found for yourself over perhaps other people who might not be working on their memory? Yeah. You know, I think the number one thing is just the sense of ease it gives you. Um, and it almost feels like you're able to give up, uh, a lot of kind of stress and worry that most people have about mm. information and memory. You know, think about you're going into a meeting and uh, people are asking you questions, telling you information. And I'm sure there's some little stress factor in the back of your mind thinking like, well, man, I can't, I don't know if I can hold all this information. What if he asked me a question and I bomb it? Mm. Um, think of that 
if that fear was eliminated, right? And you were confident, 100% confident that the information that they were telling you, you were storing it and able to access it, no problem, right? Mm -hmm. That would free you up to work on other things, you know, maybe being a little more uh, interesting with with how you speak and, and just how you carry yourself. You could talk about other things and not worry about memory, you know? Yeah. Um, so that part I think has been great. Just being, being able to be confident in my memory and knowing that it's this vault, uh, if I'd like it to be. Yeah. One of the things that I'm always anxious about is when, you know, I'm a, I'm a big reader. I love to listen to audiobooks and read physical books too, but I always find myself, having that like subtle fear of missing out. Like I'm reading through a book and I feel yeah. like I'm going to miss out on bringing on board something important. So yeah, it's forever to read a book. And that's kind of why I've gone to audiobooks a little bit, but I, I guess from, from a reading and knowledge uh, gaining standpoint, um, what are some, I guess, practical tips? I'm, I'm going to kind of be a little, a little selfish here and ask a more yeah. personal question. Like if we're sitting down and reading a book, um, what are some techniques that maybe simple techniques we can employ to maybe begin to uh, move the needle on, on our reading? Yeah. Uh, so the, the very foundations of, of memorizing uh, better come from paying attention. And I know that sounds super obvious, but it's, it's a fact. And it's, it's so hard these days to be fully focused on something. And that's probably why a lot of us think we have bad memories, especially now. Um, it's easy to be distracted. And so when we're reading, I'm sure a lot of us read when we have our phones right by us or we're watching TV or doing something else, you know? Uh, think of the times many years ago, if you're old enough, when a book was your entertainment, right? And you had to be just there sitting with your book alone, no other thing to entertain you. And, and I'm sure those kinds of books would stick a lot better. Um, that alone, of course, won't make you memorize a book. Um, but the next step is to then use a lot of your visual, um, your memory, visual memory, trying to come up with images of things that are of importance, you know, trying to really, as you read, visualize kind of like a, a movie passing by as you read the text. Um, obviously, we're kind of doing that as we read it, because that's how we understand words and, and sentences is, you know, it makes sense and we relate it to things in our mind. But you really want to try to imagine it's being played on a, on a, a, a screen in front of your eyes um, as it happens. And you'd find like doing stuff like that will help make the book pop a lot more. Mm -hmm. And then taking that further, you can apply some actual stronger techniques to memorize very specific uh, character names or passages or facts that you want to retain. Um, but that, that requires a little more effort. Um, we're just talking about kind of like passive kind of techniques there. Yeah. So what are, what are uh, some of those uh, more active techniques, I guess, as you're reading a book and you want, you find something that is critical and maybe you want to go back and read over it and, and really bring that on board and, and sear that inside your brain. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about kind of this, this, this one technique and then we can backtrack and see how to apply it to reading a book okay. uh, because it may sound a little complicated, but um, I'm sure there'd be, be, be a way to use it uh, to help you remember parts of a book. So um, thousands of years ago, the Greeks uh, supposedly invented this technique. And it's, it's really clever because what it does is, you know, when, when you have information that you learn, right, you hear it or you study it, and it, now it's somewhere in your brain, right, just kind of floating around. Um, the problem is, is sometimes you're able to find it and retrieve it and talk about it and recall it. Other times you're like, I know, I know it, I just can't find it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes it's just gone. Um, so the problem there is not so much that you have a bad memory. It's just that your recall, right, is tough. You can't like make the connection to the neuron that has to fire to help you remember the thing that you wanted. So the Greeks came up with this idea of, of basically finding ways to place a location on where those memories lie. So when you want to retrieve it, you know exactly where it is in your mind and you can just go get it. And the way to do that is to attach these pictures of things you're memorizing that are associations to things you're memorizing to attach them to locations of places you know already or things you know already. Hmm. Uh, so this is called a memory palace technique. And in simpler terms, it's basically just imagining uh, uh, a space like your house, um, your office, 
your school, the way to work, you know, your commute, something you know very well because you do it all the time or you're there all the time. Uh, you don't want to memorize a memory palace. It should just be in there. And what you do is you mentally walk through it, placing uh, image representations of the things you're memorizing along a path. Hmm. And then the idea is that when you want to recall it, you just say, oh, it's in my house. Let me walk back through my house. And there are the things laid out for you. You just got to translate them back to the proper information. Wow. I I'm I'm just going back to what you said about when you first you know read this or listened to this audiobook and, and you know it's some things sound kind of fluffy but until you yeah. actually put something into practice like yeah. I'm I'm sitting here listening to you describe this and it might sound fluffy to you know someone listening to this podcast right now but you know this is something that you know I'm gonna <laughs> get give a whirl because like I said I'm a uh, terrible at recalling you know, information yeah. out of a book, I, I usually uh, sit down and jot down three key takeaways from an entire book. And that's all I, right. I, I focus yeah. on retaining. But yeah. if I can, if I can short circuit that a little bit and retain a good chunk of it, and I don't have to go back and, you know, a year later, read it again and take three new things, I can just do it once and, you know, have that book, you know, yeah. in, my, in my mental palace. So this sounds like it's a very powerful uh, technique yeah. once we practice it like yeah and, and what it then comes down to is you know you got to create some memory palaces to store all the different things um for example a lot of people ask me do i just have one palace and if so how do i not get confused with other things but no i have i think about 50 different memory palaces um plus or minus a few uh, but they're different lengths some store a lot of things some store very little and i use specific ones for specific things like ones I have for cards, other ones I have for uh, numbers, and so on. And the way I think of it is like the more memory palace like locations you have is essentially the more hard drive you have to store um, bits of data. Mm -hmm. um, and the cool thing is, is you can always create new memory palaces. It's not like a fixed thing. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be your houses or your apartments. You can use fictional ones. You can even use, you know, Nowadays, people are obsessed with Fortnite and all these virtual <laughs> worlds. You can use those worlds as well. Yeah. If you know it well enough, right? Yeah. Do you, do you sometimes misplace information in your palace? Sometimes, yeah. Or sometimes I have gaps. You know, like I, you know, for a good example is memorizing numbers. We go for five minutes and we try to look at uh, as many digits as possible. And I end up using a memory palace that has about 60 locations. And I put seven digits uh, or eight digits sometimes at each location and you know i'm doing that pretty fast and sometimes you know everything's good but there's just one location that just is empty for me um and you know that happens it's just, sometimes i don't come up with a, a good enough picture for that location for those numbers and that's kind of what the practice is all about is trying to you know minimize those occurrences because yeah. that's kind of like a, a fail at the competition mm -hmm. So is this, like, I, I love to meditate every single morning. Is this, is this something that, um, you know, you sit there and memorize things and then when you're recalling it, is this almost like a meditative, uh, I guess, event for you or, or can you kind of describe it a little bit? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. You know, I, a lot of people ask me if I meditate and I, I, I don't, um, but I always say, you know, actually, I think when I sit down and time myself and I'm three, two, one, go memorizing, it is kind of a meditation because I'm sitting there blocking everything out, but this thing that I'm doing, and it takes tremendous focus, and it's super calming for me. Um, you know, I, I get to explore these worlds that I've created, and um, I just feel really peaceful and comfortable there, and it kind of like lets everything melt away, um, and it's kind of my daily habit as well, you know, to, to kind of center myself. So it, it definitely feels a bit probably like what meditation is for you. Yeah. So what are some of your other uh, daily practices that you uh, employ every single day, um, you know, to keep your memory skills sharp? Yeah, so, so I'll train these, tech, these techniques specific for events at competitions, and, and that varies uh, throughout the year depending on which competitions I'm training for. Uh, there's a U.S. championship coming up at the end of the month, so I'm, I'm kind of in high gear for that. Um, but aside from that, there's kind of other things that aren't so technical that also can help memory. And I work on those too, especially leading up to these competitions. I want to be, you know, 
my my memory to be perfectly fueled you know yeah um and that's one is sleep uh trying to get enough sleep um you know every day uh, i try to get at least seven hours and i just had a baby half uh half a year ago so it's <laughs> very tough <laughs> um diet is a big thing too um and actually this month leading up to the competition i just cut out all sugar and a uh, very low carb diet uh, just because that helps remove a lot of the fog uh, helps me be a little clearer and being clearer helps me go a bit faster when I memorize um, what else uh, exercise that's a huge part of my daily routine it's kind of the, it's actually the first thing I do when I wake up I go to the gym early and I really push myself and without that uh, I feel like I'm a mess so yeah. that's a, a big part to keeping my brain uh, kind of honed as well so you, you mentioned blocking out distractions and, and getting laser-like focus can you describe a little bit um how you uh, go about doing that and and just stay keeping your brain focused on the task at hand yep yeah it's it's not easy uh and especially with something so mental because you know as soon as you kind of realize that maybe your attention diverted for a second you suddenly think about that and then all you're doing in your head is talking about the fact that you just diverted your attention and then it's just like this thing that builds on itself you know you gotta like it's getting out of control you gotta get back it's hard so um what i do a lot is i'll practice with a lot of distractions so these memory competitions are absolutely silent and you wear these you know soundproof headphones you can wear like blinders you try to minimize as much distraction as possible but you know, even in those competitions, your heart is racing and there's so much stress and you might see out of your peripheral vision, somebody moving. Ah. So um, I try to really take those distractions to the extreme so that when it comes to that easier situation, it's, it's just cake. So I'll, I'll do it with the TV on specifically something that I would be interested in listening to, you know, mm -hmm. um, or I'll uh, do it in public where I know people will be looking at me or, you know, random things could happen that I'm not prepared for. Uh, I've also done it while working out. Um, so try to elevate my, my heart rate and, um, and try to memorize under those conditions on a treadmill, on the rower, um, things like that. So that really helps kind of prepare me for the, the easier, quiet versions of competitions, you know? Yeah, you got to put yourself through the fire a little bit so you can handle uh, anything. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's shift gears a little bit because I want to dig into a little bit uh, of some of your other activities. You, you're an avid mountain climber, and you've you've attempted at Everest three times. Do, do I That's right. That yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, describe those experiences. I mean, what what, what was uh, that like, and uh, what kind of drove you to get into mountain climbing? Yeah, you know, it's um, I've always loved traveling. I've always loved being near the mountains, and I, there was something kind of around the same time I, I got into memory techniques where. Maybe I was just open to everything. I wanted to try everything. And I said to myself, you know what? I'd love to take a mountaineering course. And I did. I went to the Cascades in Washington and did a week course. We climbed Mount Rainier. And then I was hooked. Uh, and the next thing I wanted to do was climb something bigger. So I went and did Mount McKinley, uh, Denali, and then Mont Blanc. And then before I knew it, I had my eyes set on Everest. And I pulled it all together. And you know, it wasn't easy because it's a very expensive trip. It's very dangerous, takes a lot of time out of your life, um, but I managed to prioritize it and, and I made it happen. I don't, it's crazy to think of sometimes when I think back on it, but I kind of uh, brought it all together to tie it to memory. I started a charity called Climb for Memory mm -hmm. uh, because I thought, okay, if I'm doing these mountains, maybe I should do it for something that's meaningful, uh, some bigger cause, bigger than myself, and hopefully do some good, make people aware of something and that thing that something was alzheimer's which you know brought it back to memory and my my grandmother and so each time i've gone it's been a, a fundraising effort and uh, an awareness raising effort as well as my personal dream to climb it and so that adds a little bit more to the experience um but climbing everest and climbing in general it's just this super humbling experience i think that's really why i like it the most is because I just feel so small and insignificant and it's this really refreshing feeling and you know you put yourself at risk and and you're so close sometimes to the line of potentially dying 
that you feel alive more than any time you know in your life and and the problem with with these types of experiences that once you have it it's hard to find somewhere else and you 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 need it uh so that makes you go and climb something else and uh yeah it's 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 a it's an, an incredible experience to climb a mountain yeah so how how uh close did you get to uh, the summit so my closest uh was 2011 i got within 50 meters of the top wow what uh yeah. what turned you back so that year, uh, my oxygen mask uh, malfunctioned, and uh, I basically climbed without it up until the Hillary step, and uh, it just killed me. You know, I, I it destroyed me. I was in good shape before that, and then you know I was just wrecked. I sat down uh, right before the Hillary step, and my Sherpa turned up my oxygen and to try to help me a bit, but I was like, I was out of it. Um, and, you know, it was just another hour to the summit. It's, you can almost see it. And, uh, yeah, you know, you have to think, okay, I got to come down as well, which takes another eight to ten hours. Yeah. So I was just like, no, I, I, I got to cut my losses and go back down. and I'll come back another time. And I did, you know, I, I did two more times, but I've had different issues each time. Weather, um, I got sick once, so... It's not easy for me. It's not been easy. I've had. I don't think climbing is made for someone my build, um, but you know, mentally, I feel like I can do it eventually. So, yeah, it's you know all these uh, these the I'll call them crucible uh, type events like these extreme adventures. They're all they're all mental. Like I, I yeah, you know, me personally, I like doing uh, you know go rock challenges and and oh, nice. type stuff like like that and and it's all it's all mental games and not a mental game but it's all you know mindset and yeah and really saying no i can do this and i'm just barely scratching the surface of what i'm capable of and so people uh you know they they tend to they tend to uh sell themselves short uh, on many facets of their life and you know it sounds like you've kind of unlocked a you know with with the um you know the memory uh, field, you kind of unlocked a passion within yourself. It's been a pathway for you to excel and, and uh, you know, go many, many different places in your life and have a life of yeah. an adventure. Yeah, it's it's been a, the memory thing has been an amazing kind of gift because it showed me that you know we have these narratives that we build for ourselves. Like I have a bad memory. That's me, right? That's my life. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you tell yourself what you want and you end up believing it. Um, but if somebody's able to change that or you have kind of this aha moment where it shifts that, you know, that can change everything. And this is what it did for me is is it opened my eyes to thinking like, okay, maybe I can do more than I, I'm thinking, not just in memory, but in every application. And I, that's probably what got me to Everest, you know? Who would have thought? Like, I just wanted to climb one little mountain and then the next thing I knew, I found myself on Everest for a third time. Uh, so, and I'm not, I'm not a professional mountaineer, you know, it's just like, I was just very passionate about it and I worked at it. Yeah. And it's, people tend to overcomplicate things too. And yeah. they think that it, it's, it's impossible because it's such this, uh, this audacious goal. And when you really yeah. break it down, um, you know, what gets you 80% of the way there are the simple things. Just yeah. eating, like you said, eating right, sleeping right, exercising right hydrating right are, are kind of the keystones of whether you're a, a memory athlete or a physical athlete or or just a mom dad trying to be there for their kids like it, you, yeah. you know the simple things uh, go such a long way yeah 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 there's so many distractions and interferences that don't matter it's you just got to focus on those simple things and you know really weed out a lot of the you know I, so i made a video on this on my youtube channel recently and it, it was talking about you know, I run these, I run some kind of trips to Kilimanjaro and Everest Base Camp, and everybody's always interested in joining, of course, right? Why wouldn't they be? But nobody, it's so rare, like the people that follow through, it's very small. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's always the same excuses. I'm busy, you know, I don't have the money right now, or maybe next year. And it's like, you know, people have these, want to do so many different things, they are distracted so easily. And it's, you just got to think like, what's most important to you? Do the simple things and focus on those things and, and, and make progress there and, and get those 
things done. You know, if, if you really wanted to go climb uh, Kilimanjaro, you would have done it, you know, like if that really was what you wanted to do. Um, and I, I feel like people miss that sometimes and, and I'm not perfect with it either, but um, I have these moments where I'm like, okay, this, sh this stuff isn't important. Let me focus on what's important. And, and that's where I see the gains, you know, in, in those specific um, arenas. Yeah. Focus on what's important. I, I love that. And, you know, so many people, and it sounds so simple. So many people just, yeah. like I said, overcomplicate it. But Nelson, we are starting to bump up against time, but I want sure. to leave a few minutes here at the end to, uh, you know, let you uh, talk about how, you know, I know you have a book and, uh, you know, let people know how to get in touch with you if they're interested in, uh, you know, maybe working with you and seeing, uh, you know, how they can improve their memory. Let us know how they can do that. Yeah, so uh, people can reach out to me on my website, nelsondellis.com. Um, I do private coaching. Uh, I speak for businesses and do workshops on memory. Um, so if anybody's interested, they can reach out to me there. Um, I just came out with a book last September called Remember It. Um, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, everywhere. Um, just search for it. And um, I also have my YouTube channel. You can just search my name, and there's a bunch of uh, free simple memory technique videos that I have up on there. Awesome. Right on, man. Well, is there any uh, last second uh, golden nuggets you want to drop on us that we maybe haven't had a chance to uh, cover? Otherwise? Yeah. I mean, the main thing is, is, is just try, right? Just go out there and what, and use your memory. What's the worst that can happen? You're going to forget. Okay. Um, but you'll, you'll be surprised how much better your memory can be if you give it uh, a little bit of love. Awesome, man. Well, Thanks again for joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, I, this has been a, an amazing conversation and I'm really excited to uh, get this out to the world and, uh, you know, spread the, spread the word of what, what you've got going on here. Perfect, man. Thanks for having me.